As we begin this time of proclamation today, let me read first from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Words spoken by the prophet to a people lost in exile. The prophet writes, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. So today is Super Bowl Sunday, and under usual circumstances, today would be one of the biggest party days of the year, right? Certainly Tampa, the city that is hosting this year's Super Bowl, would be quite the site for celebration, except for that pesky pandemic that's uh, still hanging around, right? Even still, I suspect there's a lot of excitement in Tampa. My goodness, their hometown team is in that very same Super Bowl. Even with all the restrictions, I'm sure there will be much celebrating in Tampa, even if it's a little tempered by COVID-19. Kansas City, both in Missouri and Kansas, will be full of excitement too, no doubt, as they root for their team to win it all for the second straight year. And I hope that even though you probably changed your usual Super Bowl plans, and the commercials won't be nearly as fun as they usually are. I hope that for four hours or so, you can watch and enjoy, even celebrate this great sports tradition called Super Bowl Sunday. But we know that the big game cannot last forever. And soon it will be over, and I wonder, what will Tampa... Kansas City and all the other party sites look like after all that pomp and socially distant celebrating are over. All the problems and challenges that were there before will have to be picked up and dealt with again. I can't help but think those same things about Capernaum, this city where Jesus was at the beginning of our gospel reading this morning. Listen, listen to this amazing story from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. Mark writes, As soon as Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Let us pray. These are your words, O Lord. Your word is the truth. Lead us into the truth. Amen. What an incredible day this must have been in Capernaum, right? The scene that Mark describes makes it easy to picture what that town in, in northern Israel looked like, at least when Jesus was there. It was full of hope. It was full of optimism because their town was graced by the presence of a man who could cast out demons and heal the sick. You'll remember our story, perhaps, from last week when Jesus was preaching in the Capernaum synagogue and a man possessed by an unclean spirit stood up and was healed. Now, after worship, Jesus goes to the home of Simon and Andrew and heals Simon and Andrew, Simon's mother-in-law who was in bed with a fever. And I love the image of Simon's mother-in-law in bed with a fever one moment, and then up and serving a little lunch the next, 
right? If the food was abundant, the laughter was rolling, the party was on, right? And that was only the beginning of the party. By sundown, the whole town had heard about this healer, and they show up on the doorstep of Simon and Andrew's house, and I can just imagine them, just picture them with their infirmities. I have leprosy, Jesus. Poof, Jesus heals. My leg is broken, Jesus. Poof, right? I'm, I'm so depressed I can hardly get out of bed. Poof, right? I have a fever of 106. Poof, I have periodic convulsions and foam at the mouth. Poof, I'm a raging alcoholic. Poof, right? One after another they came limping to Jesus. And one after another was cured of what ailed them. What an incredible day, right? The party would have rivaled any Super Bowl party, COVID or not, right? Jesus healing them and Simon's mother-in-law asking them if they wanted some stew or perhaps something to drink, right? The dancing and celebrating must have gone well into the next morning. The truth is, I don't, I don't have any problem imagining what that scene was like. What stirs up my imagination, though, is what did it look like the next day and the day after? Well, we don't have to imagine, I suppose, because Mark continues the story. And he writes about this very thing in chapter 1, verses 35 to 39, the immediate verses following the reading I just shared a few moments ago. Mark continues, In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone's searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. So when they found that Jesus was gone, suddenly they were searching for him. And I bet they were. right? Like the guy with paralysis who couldn't get out of bed the day before. Couldn't find anybody to bring him to Jesus. And now needs to be healed. Or the guy whose neck was healed the day before by Jesus, but all of that celebrating and he injured his, his leg. It's broken now. He needs healing too. A whole other lot of injured and sick and tired and lame were probably on Simon and Andrew's doorstep wondering if Jesus could come out and, and play. But Jesus was nowhere to be found. And when Simon finally catches up to Jesus and says, there you are, everyone's been looking for you, Jesus doesn't say, hey, Simon, just give me a second. Let me finish up my morning prayers and I'll, I'll be right there. He says, let's, let's get out of here. Let's go to the next town. Jesus leaves all those who were still sick and in need of healing and he just goes to the next town, right? I know what Capernaum looked like the day Jesus was there, right? That was a happy celebration, but what did it look like after he left? What was Capernaum like as day after day they wondered, is he ever going to come back and heal the rest of us? Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you've, you've come to God in need of healing? Do you ever feel like you've fallen on your face in front of Jesus, begging him, begging him, pleading with him to fix what ails you, what is burdening you and your family and your community and beyond? And he's just moved on to the next town, the next person, the next problem, and left you in the lurch. I felt that way before, aching with grief, writhing in pain, struggling in one way or another, begging, begging for God to help me, and been met with silence. You probably have too. 
What are we to say about such things? There's no easy answers, of course. I understand that God sometimes says no to our even noble requests for healing. But when I look at the way some among us have suffered, when all God has to do is utter the word and you will be healed, it, uh, it tears me up. And I'm not come to give easy or flip answers to a very serious question. Why is it that while some are healed of their infirmities, others suffer seemingly alone while Jesus moves on to someplace else? Finally, I can't answer that question fully. But I do catch a pretty good glimpse of the reason toward the end of that reading I shared just a moment ago. In Mark 1.38, Jesus says, Let us go so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that's what I came to do. Right? Jesus' earthly ministry of healing and casting out demons wasn't the reason that God became a human being. God did not take on flesh so that we might walk through life free of sickness and pain. God became a human in the person of Jesus Christ to usher in something totally new, to cure our greatest sickness, sin and death. Jesus came to take care of our separation from God. Jesus came to take on death and transform it into something that would forever separate us from God's presence into a gateway right, to an eternity with God in paradise. And he hits the road out of Capernaum to go to other towns and proclaim that message. What Jesus did for the people in Capernaum that Saturday gave them joy for the moment and revealed who he was, right? Because what he did for them on the cross would give them joy for eternity. His earthly ministry of healing and teaching, that was just the opening act. The main show was his work on the cross as he died and rose again to give those who believe in him eternal life. The people that Jesus healed in Capernaum, they got sick again. Simon's mother-in-law, no doubt, eventually found herself sick in bed one day. And you know, eventually she also died. But those whom Christ has claimed as his own, who then breathe their last, will be raised up with new bodies, incapable of sickness and disease, incapable of pain and suffering, incapable of sin and death. The healing that Jesus does in this lifetime is merely a sign which points us to a still greater truth and a still greater healing. Anything he does for us in this world just points us to a truth of what is headed our way in the world to come. The one who opened up with earthly healing and then gave his main act through death and resurrection, is coming back for an encore, praise be to Christ. So if you are suffering, if you feel like God has neglected you in your aches and pains and various infirmities, take heart, for our Lord is not done with you yet. He is with you as you suffer, giving you strength to endure, and even more importantly, a sure and certain hope for the future. This one who healed in Capernaum has only just begun, my friends. And he hasn't forgotten about you and simply moved on to the next town and the next trouble and the next problem. Let us cling to that in hope. And as a sign of our faith in this one who is to come, let us continue to gather together week after week for worship in whatever way God empowers us to gather. Right? And to share that same meal that Jesus shared with his disciples all those many years ago, in whatever way you can. Right? Let us go on pouring water over the heads of infants and adults and claiming them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us go on right, uttering the words that he taught us to pray. Let us go on convinced that when everything else passes away, right, the promises of God will still carry us through to the other side. 
Let us go on trusting in him, for a day is coming soon when it will be just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.